Hi guys, it's Steph from iDriver Classic and I know a lot of you thought that I've gone really serious with some of the car reviews. We've had Rolls Royces, we've had amazing cars like the Plymouth Fury and today we're back to the bonkers world of early iDriver Classic and we're taking out this amazing Bond mini car and it's called, very imaginatively, Mr Bond. I'm really excited to take you guys out in this car today and it's a bit of a funny, silly little video um, and I just thought you'd really enjoy it because you never see these cars around and if you do, they're parked up doing nothing at a car show. I got offered the chance to drive it, PS, it was terrifying and I thought, do you know what? Let's do it. Let's film this today. So this bonkers small video is a little tour around this amazing Bond mini car. Now, as we look around this Bond mini car today, you'll be in one of two camps. And I'm probably going to be able to work it out which way you are from the comments section. You're either going to think this is absolutely hilarious and I would definitely have a go. Or you're going to think, what is that death trap doing on the road? It only belongs in a museum. Personally, I'm more of the hilarious, let's give it a bash sort of girl. But believe it or not, the Bond mini car wasn't just a one-hit wonder, as some of you might think it was. The Bond mini car, which operated at the time of launch under Sharps Commercials Limited, made a range of three-wheel microcars between 1949 and 1966. And later on, it broke away and it became Bond mini cars, no, Bond Cars Limited in 1964. The Bond mini car was created from a prototype built by Lawrence Bond, who was an engineer from Preston, which kind of might answer the questions that some of you have about why these were built in Preston, Lancashire, for those of you watching abroad. And the car was designed to give people who needed a town car something they could comfortably do shorter journeys in or get into around 20 or 30 miles in a journey. But trust me, when we go for a drive, you'll see that those would have been some pretty hard miles because it's super loud. So at the time of prototype, which of course later on became the Bond Mini Car Type A, you had a cruising speed of around 30 miles per hour. But by this point, that had, by the point of the Mark G, which we're testing today, that had almost nearly doubled to around 55, although 40 is scary enough. Now it was a courageous time to start a new car brand because after the war, Britain was really poor and buying a car, especially when rations were still in full swing, wasn't at the top of everyone's list. And interestingly, it was one of the first cars to utilize fiberglass body panels and also aluminium, which was a really clever idea in post-war steel shortage stricken Britain because you would have been on a waiting list for cars and basically it was really difficult to get a car and this helped people get on the ladder. Now, you might think that three wheels was a bit of a daft idea because it does look a bit daft in 2020. However, at the time, it was a stroke of business genius because purchase taxes meant that a three wheeler qualified for lower purchase tax rates and cheaper car insurance, which meant that people that hadn't been able to afford a car previously were suddenly able to enter the market. And for reference, at the time of bond cars coming to market, the purchase tax on a new car was 55%. And the purchase tax on a three-wheeler was 25%. So that's a massive 30% difference. Plus a three-wheeler, although a lot more agricultural than its four-wheeler counterpart, was something which could, at the time, be driven on a motorcycle license. And this was because of the three wheels, the low weight and a lack of reverse gear, although the Reverse gear was added as an optional extra later on down the line with the addition of a Dynastar unit. Sadly, the advantages of the taxing laws which had helped bond cars rise to the top actually became the reason the company kind of came to an end because the heavy purchase taxes on cars started to lift in April 1962 being reduced down to 45% and they were then reduced down again in the November of 1962 all the way down to 25% which of course as we already know is the same as the three wheelers and because of the cost of these cars it actually then meant that a Bond Mini car so something like this was more expensive than a BMC Mini which means that if you've got that choice and you've got that driver's license, you're probably going to go for a Mini. Now, due to this, sales nosedived from 1962, and the company closed in 1966, which to me is a massive shame, because although it's slightly bonkers and it's wonderfully impractical in our busy modern world, they provided a cheap motoring lifeline for many would-be motorists and helped give a means of transport to many who would have otherwise had to struggle on without. I mean, we're in Lincolnshire today, rural Lincolnshire. This would have been great. And although the Bond... Mark F mini car was the most po wasn't the most popular. 
although the Mark F Bond Mini Car was the most popular of the Bond cars, the Mark G came about from change within the industry. So 1959 saw the launch of several smaller cars, including the iconic BMC Mini, and the Bond car team went back to the drawing board to deliver a car which would better serve the buying audience and compete a little better with newer cars to the market as well. And although it didn't look too different from the Mark F, you can spot the detail with the grille, by the way, if you just pass it when at a show, the Mark G offered things which had been overlooked in the design for the Mark F. So I know that in the Mark F they had the upgraded engine, but it's worth talking about anyway. So the engine in this is the Villiers 246cc engine which offered a top speed of 55 miles per hour and an impressive 60 miles per gallon economy which is insane the rear suspension had moved on enormously from the mark f and you had your trailing arms coil springs and hydraulic shock absorbers and despite not needing much to stop because look how light the car is the brakes were reconsidered too and supported a new lockheed hydraulic system and it was kind of that idea that they were trying to move the car forward more from a bit of a gimmick in to a car and in fact if you think about it the engine might seem a bit small for this car but it's worth noting that the Mark E which came before the Mark F only had the 197cc Villiers engine so for the mini car fan the new engine was great because it still achieved the same MPG but you have got a bit of extra speed for good measure. Now, in addition to changes under the bonnet and with the brakes, the headroom was rejigged on the saloon to make carrying adults in the back a possibility. And until this point, wind down windows weren't even a thing. And amazingly, this isn't actually as small as it probably looks on the pictures and in the video because it is actually 11 feet long. Although for me, a lot of that is kind of wasted over in that engine bay. The width is four foot and no matter which model you went for, it had a curb weight of 672 pounds, or if you're watching from abroad, 305 kilos. So, of course, with our top speed of 55, I didn't try and achieve that today because 40 was terrifying enough, as you'll see on our test drive. And in my opinion, it's a bit nutty, but carry on watching because it is a laugh. And I think that if taxation laws hadn't changed, I think Bond Mini Cars probably would have con continued in some sort of way. Because if you think about smart cars today, in my opinion, that's where Bond Cars really should have taken that space. But Hey ho, let's watch this video, but first of all, let's have a chat with the owner, Annie, because only just over 3,000 of these were sold, and it seems like a massive privilege to take one out today, because it's not the easiest thing to find, and Annie has been really generous lending us this car today. So let's have a catch up with Annie before we take it out for a test drive. I'm Annie Lloyd. Basically, I own Mr. Bond. Mr. Bond was owned by Brian Redshaw. Brian Redshaw was my ex-husband. And basically, he left me Mr. Bond before he died. He wanted to go to Cadwell Park in Mr. Bond, but I'm afraid I never got in there. It was so upsetting. But as I say, we keep him now to keep everybody happy and make people laugh. Kids love him. People love him. Everybody loves him. Everybody knows him as Mr. Bond. It's never the car. It's always Mr. Bond. Always. Basically, I've had him now seven years been a long seven years because he breaks down he smokes everybody out he's is basically I'm sure my ex-husband that died I'm sure his spirit lives in Mr Bond and he'll be with us for a long time yet I hope so if you've watched my snuggy video you'll know that I've got a bit of a thing for cars which are a little bit bonkers and this does not disappoint because this is the most bonkers car experience that I've had since the Snuggie and I have laughed more today than I probably have in the last month. This has really put a smile on my face so I'm hoping that it's going to put a smile on your face too. If for nothing else, what should we try to navigate around the corner later on? Now over here we have got a whacking great space for a glove box which is really handy because the boot is really impractical on these. You have to take out the full back seat and it is just a massive fat. It's not really that user friendly. Now, as we come into the center, you've got a rear view mirror, but to be honest, the car is so small, there's nothing behind you, really. Um, you can pretty much just look over your shoulder. You've got almost 100% visibility. Now, as you come down, you've got a speedo, and look, this car is bonkers. It runs from 70 down to zero. I don't know, you don't know, none of us know why. And then over here, we've got our column change, so I'm gonna come back to that and show you. We've got three, just three warning lights over here. And then we've got our key, and we come down to our lights, 
and our wipers so of course the wipers are one speed i wouldn't really expect them to be anything else now over here we've got our amp meter and over here we have got the indicators and i think this is bakelite um which is kind of a early plastic now i wanted to talk to you about starting the car as well because this is where it gets a little bit weird so what i'm going to do because when we start this car you are not going to believe how loud it is now down here we've got a little um pull switch so we need to pull that when we start the car and then as well as that we have got the key so we need to be starting this car up and tried it a few times so i've come up with a fail safe method now we need to be flicking this silver thing over here we need to be turning the key and we need to be pumping the pedal at the same time which i know many of you love maybe not for the same reasons as well as that we've got our handbrake down here you can see it's an umbrella handbrake it's what we'd expect to find and then we've got the horn as well. So I'm just going to flick the ignition on so you can hear that. I feel like there's a cheeky little horn for a cheeky little car. Now we've done all that, I thought I'd just talk you very quickly through the column change. Although, honestly, it is mind-boggling. Let me show you. And P.S. We don't have reverse. So I wanted to show you how we change gears. So I'm going to put my foot down on the clutch. Now we come up into first. And we're in neutral there. Go down once in second down twice into third. It's a really, really weird system. Um, and I guess it will become more apparent as we drive how it works because it's so difficult to demonstrate. I've recorded this bit a couple of times actually and uh, it doesn't get any easier. When we take this out for a drive, so we're gonna start it up first, you probably won't be able to hear me very well. So what I'm gonna do is use a small segment to demonstrate how loud it is. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pre-record and just talk over it and talk to you a little bit about the driving experience at the same time. So I hope that's okay, but otherwise the video was gonna kind of be unwatchable from this point on. So let's start the car up and you're gonna hear what I mean in a minute. So remember, we're pulling this little silver lever and we're turning the key and we are pumping that gas. Let's go. Now we're gonna get this car started up because, um, and we are leaving the windows open because it just seems really smoky inside the cabin. I'm not sure if that's a normal characteristic for these or I'm being slowly gassed out of the car. Um, we're going to start, of course, by pulling this little silver switch, this little silver, uh, this little silver toggle. And then, of course, we're going to be turning the key at the same time and pumping the gas as well, which I know some of you like. Now, let's get started. The pedals are in a really weird place, by the way. Right, so I'm just going to get that started. It is a little bit temperamental. It doesn't always work, and I don't know why. If my Marina played this game, it would be off. And there we go, we have success. Now, as you can probably hear, it's super loud. So I'm going to go into each gear, and um, you can hear what it's like. And by the way, it's really weird. One, where I would talk as I drove, and this version where I didn't, because unfortunately the car is so astronomically loud that not only could I not have a conversation with Tom who was filming it, the filming that came back from this when I was talking and driving at the same time just was absolute garbage. So you get a second version from me where I talk to you as I go for a little bit of a drive and roughly work off what I was saying at the same time. So you probably noticed that I went round a corner with a bit of confidence, which trust me, I did not have on the first test drive. We tested this on a country road today that's straight because A, I'm a bit of a chicken who wasn't about to take this around millions of winding bands, especially with only three wheels. And number two, we are in Lincolnshire today, which is home to 
probably the flattest and straightest roads in the UK. Now one of the first things that really struck me when I took this out for a drive was it almost felt like, and for those of you that have driven on ice, it felt a little bit like that. The car didn't, I didn't really feel like I had much control over the car, which at first was terrifying, but weirdly I quickly got into because as you can probably notice, I keep writing that steering wheel and I did a bit of digging on the internet and it seems that I'm not the only one who's kind of had that experience with the car. It was really, really loud, um, which meant that that idea that Bond came up with when they first went out there with that idea that you would only be doing journeys of 20 to 30 miles, um, I think even that would be slightly ambitious because my test route today was only about, what, four miles? And even that was enough for me. However, these cars weren't designed for somebody living in 2020 who has experienced a plethora of different cars. These cars were for people that needed a car that was super economical that they could afford on the smallest of budgets and maybe it was a first car for many people and if you think about it we are in a car that was initially a concept from the 40s it didn't massively change i mean you've got various upgrades and things like the suspension the engine was increased but by and large the general consensus of it and the way that it was put together is very much a 40s idea and it wasn't designed to be top of the range it was merely designed to get people on that ladder and let's look at it from that merit alone so number one it has got really good leg room in the back you could easily and we've got somebody filming in the back who is over six foot tall and i think you could easily get two adults in the front i mean as many of you like to remind me in the comments section every week i'm not slim the gear and you could easily get two of me in the front and i reckon you could get two kids in the back which look if you're on a budget you could definitely make this work as a family car although you wouldn't be getting any children accidentally falling asleep in the back as you drove do I think it's something you could drive in 2020? Probably not, but it is jolly good fun to take out around these little roads. And if you had it to take to Asda or to take to car shows and stuff, it is fun for that very reason alone, but it wouldn't be a good choice for a second or a occasional classic car. But you know what? This has made me smile and it's made me laugh more than any other car I've tested in what, the last year? and lockdown has been really hard and i haven't actually had that many reasons to laugh or smile and this has really done the trick for me so is it practical absolutely not really is it economical yes is it something you'd want to drive in today's modern world probably not but is it something you'd enjoy driving and have a laugh with absolutely because it's a really really funny little car and it deserves its place in the classic car world because whilst it's not as usable as some it really served a purpose at the time and i've really enjoyed testing it today and showing you guys as well even though it's been quite a short video i hope you've enjoyed it and i hope it's been good fun for you too and i'm going to end with uh, a shot of it breaking down and then a shot of it driving away as we fixed it because well this video has been bonkers so let's end it in a bonkers way until next time take care and drive safely